Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Welcome back, Adam. Thank you. Last week, we talked about Twitter and what was going on. And this week, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. They had an ultimatum this week and a bunch of people left. Twitter is down to basically a skeleton crew. Mm -hmm. Um, We're not going to really dive into how that's going to affect the service. Although I have a feeling with the World Cup starting this weekend that we're going to see some strain on the infrastructure. I think that's a safe bet. And um, Twitter at this point. You know, we see we're seeing various estimates, but if you figure the that initial round of layoffs was pretty much half the company, and then you had the ultimatum, which as as of this recording was last yesterday at, at five PM Eastern, um, by various reports anywhere between fifty to seventy five percent of those left um, did not take the deal to join hardcore Twitter two point and so you know your guess is as good as anyone's, but I think anywhere between. 900 and 2000 people left at a company that had 7,500 working for it just a couple of weeks ago. And with how hyperscale cloud services like Twitter function, that's not going to last long. It's, it's untenable at this point. I mean, and it's been so haphazard. There's been so many great stories of just chaos, but uh, one of the highlights from yesterday was Twitter. um, Once again, it told everyone to stay home and work from home till they figured out who's actually still working for the company and they fired the guy who managed all the badges. And so they had to have him come back and let Elon and company back into the building because everyone was locked out and Elon actually tweeted and said, thanks, you're a lifesaver. So it's been a, a, a fun story to follow from a distance, but definitely um, our hearts go out to those affected and, and who are having to suddenly, uh, find new employment in a tighter job market than it had been as of just a couple of months ago. So you'll land on your feet, but again, recognize that it's tough for a lot of people and, and we're not making light of that. But again, just like a car accident or a train wreck, sometimes you can't turn away. Yes. And as InfoSec professionals, a lot of us are invested in Twitter. Mm-hmm. It is one of the main information sharing tools that we have And I talked about that last week, about how important it is for us. And many of us have gone to Mastodon, which is a defederated social network. And it's funny because I was talking with some colleagues today who are in the same job that I am. And, you know, one of the veterans um, in in my space, Steve Halligan, he's well known um, among the Microsoft folks in security. Um, he's one of the, uh, the global effectors that he, you know, he's very good at his job and, and knows a lot about security. He of course made a Mastodon account. Um, and so we were kind of talking about that, but Mastodon has definitely grown. I've been keeping a watch on this um, account that kind of keeps track of how many users are joining Mastodon. And it's, we have now passed 7.1 million accounts, um, which wow. is about five 5,000 accounts in the last hour, 238,000 accounts in the last day, 548,000 accounts in the last week. So it is growing exponentially. And so we're just going to do a show on Mastodon and, and what it is and how to use it. Um, and... We'll just talk about it. I did go through a little bit at a high level last week, um, but we're going to go a lot deeper into it. So again, it is a decentralized social media network. Decentralized meaning that there's not one person in charge. It's made up of hundreds, thousands of different servers, or we call them instances that are federated in the what's referred to as the Fediverse. And we'll explain that in a little bit. But there are a lot of similarities to Twitter, and there are all some differences. One of the best things about it is that it's ad-free. There's no ads. It doesn't mine your data. There's no telemetry. In fact, you can even opt out of search engines so that 
Google and Bing and all, DuckDuckGo, all those search engines can actually search your content. Um, so each instance has different admins that are in charge of it. And so when you're looking at picking an instance, that's usually the barrier to entry for most people because they get overwhelmed at how many different instances there are. And when you go to the official join Mastodon page, it only displays a few. Most of the instances have like a, a theme. Um, for example, art or LGBTQ tech or infosec for us. Um, and you can pick one of those or you can pick something else like a general one, like the mastodon.social. There are a lot of instances that are really big, like the original mastodon.social has... 15,000 plus, uh, actually, I think it's, it's even higher than that. It could be like 50,000, um, but it's, it's really large. Bigger servers doesn't always mean better because moderation gets a lot harder um, when you have a larger server, and we'll dive into that in a minute. But you can pick any server, and you can start an account. And if you decide that that's not the instance you want to be on, you can migrate your account. You can migrate it either by pointing your original account to a new account, which you would alias it, very similar to if you have a secondary email and you want to forward all your stuff over there and it just kind of goes. Um, when you click on, when someone clicks on your original account, it'll have a little message that says, so-and-so has indicated that their new account is this one. So you'll keep your old account, you'll keep all the posts from that one or what's sometimes referred to as toots instead of tweets. <laughs> um, although in the new Mastodon um, uh, release, the original uh, developer has basically said that that's not how he wants it to refer to anymore, but a lot of people still refer to them as toots. So you'll keep all of that. You'll keep all your followers and you'll keep all of your um, um, data on that original account and it'll just point over. Mm -hmm. You can also completely migrate accounts, which means you're removing the original account and then migrating all of that to the new instance. And that's seamless for people who follow you. They won't even notice. They'll just see you with your original followers and your posts just with a new domain. So um, what it boils down to is it doesn't really matter, but it does in the fact that when you're on an instance, those, that federation, the admins get to decide who gets to communicate with their instance. And for the most part, everyone opens up their instance to the federation so that if I'm on Mastodon.social and Adam's on Mastodon.art and then there's some journalists on journalist.host, you know, we can all communicate with each other. We can follow each other. We can see each other's posts. But if we, um, if there's an instance like Kiwi Farms or Truth Social or some other white supremacist um, instance, as an admin, I can block that instance from my instance. And hopefully Adam's admins would block that instance from their instance. And it does depend on each instance to do that. But once that's done, you're essentially isolating them from the Fediverse and they become defederated. So they're just on their own, in their own little island, communicating on their own and sprouting their own, you know, racist stuff. Um, and we're happy in our Fediverse. Mm -hmm. So it does matter because that moderation, as you get larger and larger instances, the reports depend on the moderators, which are volunteers for the instances to like, you know, read the reports, either warn the, the folks that are that are breaking the rules, the code of conduct, ban them, or uh, ban the entire instance if, if needed. So um, that's essentially the, the breakdown of, of picking an instance. You know, generally I would say pick one with a theme that you like with people that you might know and then go from there. Cause you can always move. I'm going to age myself a bit here, but your description of the Fediverse and the different instances 
reminds me of internet relay chat or IRC and IRC back in the day used to have different networks like FNet as an example. Um, and there were different IRC servers that were all part of FNet. And so you could connect to any one of those and you would see the same channels and the same users on them and so on. But if it turned out that a server was poorly moderated and allowed too many bots or spam, it could be removed from the rest of the network. And so this sounds very conceptually similar, although it seems the one major difference is with IRC, there wasn't like one network. It was never all one thing. There were these bigger networks and some of them had grown pretty large and were, you know, 20, 30, 40 servers around the world. Um, but this case sounds like for the most part, there's everyone federated in one Fediverse um, minus a couple of problematic instances that have been isolated by the moderators over time. And that seems like a very kind of natural um, process where the system's working as intended and, you know, it's excising like the cancerous cells and removing them from the rest of the universe, so to speak. So that's, um, that's pretty cool, but totally just reminds me of that. And, and you know what? a good architecture will come around again over time. And so kind of having a networked, but simultaneously decentralized model and relying on kind of amateur admins to run each of those that's been done before. And it worked really, really well. IRC was the place to be in the nineties. And, and this sounds very similar in some ways. So that kind of like tickles my fancy a little bit. That's cool. Yeah. There's a lot of people who have compared it to IRC. It's very, very similar. Um, but then of course, like it's, it's all one massive network, like the internet, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's all connected. Um, and, and it, of course it's very dependent on your admins and your moderators. If you have a bad admin and you have bad moderators, then your instance is not going to be great. Um, and of course the stability of each instance also depends on the administrators because they are hosting their own Mastodon instance. They can host it on their own hardware like i know one of the instances which is very big for developers and some cybersecurity folks actually she hosts it in her home she has a fiber connection and she has an entire rack of servers and storage and she hosts it out of her own home you could do that some people do it on cloud providers like aws or azure or other ones like digital ocean where you can Post it in the cloud and you know scale if needed, which was important because you know up until like three four weeks ago, some of these instances only had 150 people on them. Mm -hmm. Infosec Exchange, which is the one I'm on, started with 150 people four weeks ago. It is now over 22,000 users. So in four weeks, it's grown you know exponentially, and our moderator which is at Jerry at infosec.exchange, you know, he had to scale his hardware, which he, he uses cloud hosting, but, you know, he had to scale that very, very quickly. Otherwise, you know, your computing power, your, the resources that it's uh, required to run that, CPU memory storage, it, it all crashes. So it, your, your, experience within Mastodon greatly depends on the administrator who is working on that instance and understand that these guys are all volunteers. They're not paid to do this. All the admins and volunteers, they probably stood this up with their buddies, their friends. They just wanted a nice space. A lot of folks who are marginalized on the larger social media sites, they found, you know, communities within the Fediverse. So, if you have an admin that is doing a good job and you like your instance, they all usually have like a way to donate to them to help with their hosting costs. And that's a really good idea. So, um, yeah. So if you, if you like the instance, definitely donate to them to help them with, with those, those costs for hosting. Um, and if you're interested, you could also stand up your own as a tinkerer. Right. <laughs> that's, that's how I learn. As soon as I learned that you could have your own instance, my next thought was, how do I do that? And so I actually wrote a whole blog on it. 
Um, I'll link that in the notes if you're interested. But it was a fun learning experience because it took me all day. I had to flatten my box several times <laughs> um, from making mistakes. Um, I had to learn about email relays, which I've never done before, but that was a fun experience. A lot of DNS work uh, to get it working. But in the end, I, I got my own Mastodon instance. I technically now have two identities, one in infosec.exchange, which I use, and then I have my own, which I'm just messing around with. Um, but it was fun and you do get a sense of how much work it is. Even for me of like a single instance with like a couple of people in it, it was not easy. Um, so I woke up one day and my storage was full and my instance crashed and you know, like fortunately, like no one in my instance cares because they don't, they're not really using it. I was just telling them for, it was for testing, but, um, yeah. Imagine if you had 20,000 users and your storage was full and, and it crashed. So um, props to all these admins. So let's get into how to use it. Once you create an account, definitely go into the settings and enable MFA. You can enable MFA for um, like an app. And then once you do that, it has the option for fish resistant MFA to do a FIDO key. So that's what I did. The Everyone always asks what app to use. There is the official Mastodon app. So if you go into the app store on your iOS device or Android device, there's the default one. But the default one is not the best experience. It's just kind of there. The developers um, who uh, work on the source code, they've sunk a lot of time into the web UI. So the web UI is actually the most robust. But if you want an app, um, there's one called Toot exclamation mark, which costs <laughs> about three bucks from the app store. That one's really, really good. And Meta Text is free. And that one's also really good. On Android, the one that most people suggest is Tusky, T-U-S-K-Y. Uh, a Mastodon play. I got it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So... Another big difference with Mastodon is that there's no algorithm, which is refreshing and frustrating at the same time, right? Because they're not mining our data. There's no algorithm to float our interests and things that we might be interested in to the top of our timeline. So it acts as a FIFO, first in, first out, queue of events. If Adam toots at like 8 in the morning and I don't check it until eight at night, you know, there's 12 hours of my timeline. I'm probably never going to see what he posted. So it's all displayed chronologically and it's very hard to keep track of that. So people who are used to an algorithm, algorithmic timeline may find that frustrating to work around that lists are super helpful. And you could build a list from the people that you follow, and that way you can have a smaller-ish timeline to scroll through because most of those people aren't on there 24-7, so there's going to be breaks. I've made several different lists, and that's how I keep up with it. Um, so I would recommend doing that. Um, the other thing that is important to know is that when you like something like in Twitter, when you liked something, it would add it to the algorithmic timeline. And so like, if Adam followed me, he would see the things that I liked, but that doesn't happen in Mastodon. So it's called favoriting something. So when I favorite something, it's just telling the person who posted it that I liked it. That's it. So if Adam posts something and I want to just give him props and be like, Hey, that's a good post. I can just favorite it in order for people to see it. I have to boost it which is the same type of thing as like retweeting. So I have to boost it to my followers. Then it would appear on their timeline without re without boosting it. It'll just Adam will just get a notification that Andy liked this post and that's it. So that's and really interesting to me personally, because I'm a, I'm old school Twitter guy. I've been around on there forever and the other thing is I was introduced to Twitter through the ecosystem of great iOS apps for Twitter, um, going all the way back to um, Tweety 
way back in the day. And um, gosh, what was the one before that? I forget by the icon factory or something. It doesn't matter. Um, Twitterific. That's the one. Um, and, and so I've always been using third party clients for Twitter. I don't like the first party client and third party clients tend to have just a chronological timeline. That's the way I've always experienced Twitter forever and ever and ever. And, um, at one point I used to be a Twitter completionist. Like I would make sure I read every single tweet and then I followed too many people and it became impossible and got busier. So I don't really worry about being a completionist. I'll just check in and, and scroll through for a while, but it's still to me, chronological timeline. I didn't even know till you said just now, Andy, that the like act is like a boosting method. I remember again, back when they were favorites on Twitter and it was really just used as a, a signal to say, Hey, I like your tweet and B a way to like bookmark tweets. So you could come back to them later. Like, cause you can go view li- tweets you've liked or favorited back in the day. So hearing that as a description is unusual to me, although I acknowledge again, I am a bit of a Twitter unicorn in that way. So it's an interesting call out for a lot of people who are used to experiencing the default algorithmic timeline on twitter.com or in the Twitter client on iOS and Android that that's, that's normal behavior for them. So that is interesting. I think for a lot of, again, old school people on Twitter, they like the chronological timeline. They like, you know, the only way to really inject content into your, your feed is a retweet. Cause again, to me, that's the only thing I see in mine is people I follow and stuff they retweet. Otherwise I don't see it. And that's the way I've always experienced it. So again, that sounds great to me, but again, I also acknowledge him again, a bit of a Twitter unicorn. Yeah, for sure. Um, when it comes to DMS, there's not really anything like a DM it's considered visibility. So when you post something or toot, whatever you want to call it, um, you can make sure the visibility is either public unlisted or only to those mentioned. And so when you select only to those mentioned, if I at say Adam Brewer, only he's going to see it, which is really considered a DM at that point. But if I then add somebody else, the at that, that brings them into the conversation too. So think of it like if you CC somebody on an email, right? They wouldn't see the history, but they would see that particular one that you CC them on. So um, that's how DMs work. There's a lot of like talk on some of the InfoSec folks where like, oh, DMs aren't you know, private. Um, the admins can see it. That is true. But if you know anything about social media, like you don't put anything in Twitter DMs that, you know, would be sensitive. So don't put anything in DMs in Macedon that would be sensitive. Um, they are unencrypted. So, yeah. Um, the character limit is default to 500, which is kind of nice because Twitter is uh, 280, which used to be 140. But admins can actually set their own limits per instance. So infosec dot, dot exchange is actually 11,000 character limits. So you can write literally a book, I think, uh, when it comes to like social media, um, which can get very, very long. Uh, but there are ways to, to help your followers kind of sort through that. So, um, yeah. Uh, bios also have a larger limit. So put something meaningful there. That way, when someone goes to click on your bio, it's not like Twitter where there was like a really short character limit on your bio. There's no such thing as a verification. Um, you can literally just put, you know, uh, semicolon verified semicolon as the emoji and put your blue your own blue check mark. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that for at least infosec Twitter has done is you can put a custom emoji there if you supported the instance, which I think is kind of nice. There's no um, way to pay for a verification essentially. There is a way that Mastodon has built in in order to like verify you are you, which is if you have a website that is only known to you, like adambrewer.com or something like that, you could put a rel equals me attribute in the site to point back to your Mastodon instance, and that would essentially verify it. There's a verified link within your profile. 
So that's that's how verification works. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually technically, um, if you don't have a website that that can do it, I did it through Keybase by just uploading an um, a public document. You can do this in GitHub too, um, where it's just a readable document with the the URL tag in it, and then you can say that's you. So that's one way to do it. Um, but yeah, that, there's no other way. I wish there was a way to add a text file within DNS to verify the DNS, but um, there isn't at this point. So there's just a HTML tag that you have to enter into a website. You can get up to five pinned posts, which is kind of nice. Um, Twitter's only one. Content warnings is what I was referring to to help your uh, followers. So content warnings is very different than, than Twitter. Twitter was moderated by their own moderators, which would find content and then put content um, blockers on it, like sensitive content warning. Content warnings, um, as far as culture goes within Mastodon, is self-moderation. And a lot of people use content warnings in order to allow their followers to pick whether or not they want to see that. So for example, most, you know, we're on an InfoSec um, Mastodon instance, but if I wanted to post something about Twitter right now, or if I wanted to post something about politics in the U.S., I could just put content warning, U.S. politics. And then someone who may be interested in what I have to say can expand that, but they already know what it's about, right? I'm not blasting their timeline with some random thing that, you know, I want to just talk about. So that's kind of nice. As well as like longer posts, you can put long posts in your content warning and then you know, write your book that you want to do. So again, it's, it's not necessarily like a NSFW, which it could be, but it doesn't have to be, you know, if I put like dog pictures in my content warning and then I upload a picture of my dog, you can decide whether or not you want to see that. If you don't, you can just scroll right by. So it's, it's highly encouraged and it's used as a courtesy, um, for that, con uh, versus like, you know, Twitter, which is moderated f with centrally through their moderators. Hashtags are also really, really important because there's no algorithm. You can follow different hashtags. Like obviously I followed hashtag InfoSec and then that will appear on my timeline, just like in Twitter. I think you can do that in Twitter as well. Follow different hashtags um, and they can be searched. It's encouraged to use them liberally on your posts so that people have more visibility on it. And they should be, uh, what's referred to as camel style, meaning that you capitalize each word, which enables screen readers to identify different words in the tag. So people who are, you know, not necessarily reading it, but they're getting it read back to them, which is very similar to photos. With every photo that you upload, you should put a caption. You have the option to put a caption and you should. It's also referred to as alt text because people have screen readers for folks who are, visually impaired so the more descriptive that you make it the more people can appreciate your post which by the way on the alt text thing twitter actually does support for your photos um and i know donna sarkar from microsoft who is um does a lot of work today with with a lot of microsoft's uh accessibility efforts um for the differently abled uh talks a lot about doing this on twitter and and gives people a lot of praise when they correctly alt text their images. So do it on Mastodon, but even if you're not doing Mastodon, alt text your photos on Twitter as well. Like I said, Mastodon has its own culture and that's because it's been around for a while. It's been around since 2016 and it's mostly been built by marginalized communities who are coming together and, you know, deciding that they were done with the drama on Twitter and they tried to forge like a more comfy space for themselves that's free of any type of corporate influence. And for a lot of people, it this almost felt like a home invasion. I mentioned that last week because there was this guy who posted this whole um, blog about it. And I'll link the blog in the show notes, but I'll, I'll just read some of it here. His analogy was like, you're sitting quietly in a comfy carriage chatting with a couple of your friends and then the entire platform of football fans gets 
um, in on the state station. Um, so he's obviously from England here um, after their team lost. And they don't usually catch trains. They don't know the protocol. They assume everyone on the train was at the game or at least follows football. They crowd the doors and complain about the seat configuration. Um, and so there's this this whole you know storming, which I think people coming to the platform is good. I think boosting this type of um, social media network, this decentralized network is good. But we do have to have some respect. You want to be patient and friendly because... We're new, and there's people who have been using this platform for eight years or six years. Um, so definitely uh, be patient. The The strain on the instance admins um, rushing to increase the capacity is real. Um, you know, even as as I'm speaking, you know, people are, are leaving Twitter. There's actually an instance for people who worked at Twitter – um, which is really ironic that they are in Mastodon, like old tweeps, they call them. Um, people who worked at Twitter, who have been laid off, who have been fired, who have quit, and there's a whole Mastodon instance just for them. Um, so, you know, have patience because it's, it's definitely, um, there can be some stability issues and um, the culture is a little bit different. So don't treat it like Twitter. I have had a great experience on infosec.exchange. It's it's people have been more open. They've been more welcoming. The the interactions feel a lot more real. Um, it's it's less toxic. I, I just I don't know how to explain it, but it's it's been great as far as um, moving from Twitter to Mastodon. And so I know we're spending a lot of time on this, but it like I said, it's important because it is one of the few main information sharing tools that we have as information security professionals. There's a lot of CVEs that come out, a lot of ways that people um, talk about how to mitigate stuff like that, different uh, threat intel, um, tons of threat intelligence comes out, um, you know, via Twitter, but now is now coming out via Mastodon. Um, and so I, I think having a presence there, knowing how to use it, how to collect that information. Information security professionals are great at collecting information and sharing and disseminating that. And so that's, you got to have a platform to do that. Um, hosting is super expensive. So if you can, and you're, you're able to donate to your admins, um, Jerry, who runs the InfoSec um, exchange, he posted, that he, um, is currently running on 112 CPU uh, vCPUs, which is 224 threads and one terabyte of RAM across six servers. So uh, don't complain. If you don't like what your devs or admins are doing, you can move instances or start your own. The The culture thing is interesting because it is fundamentally a different tool. There's definitely a lot of similarities, but obviously it's different as well. And, and I always find it interesting because I've been on mainstream social channels on the internet, as well as kind of the, the rougher edges of the internet. I remember hotline back in the day, Usenet. Um, we talked about IRC and, and many of those were never mainstream. You know, they, they appealed to, to geeks, let's be honest. Um, because there was a little bit of a barrier to entry. I remember the something awful forums, which were, were, um, moderated with an iron fist. They did allow some, you know, kind of tasteless humor, but at the same time, like the rules were the rules and the rules were strictly enforced and they required $10 to get in you $10 to register an account. And this was at a time when, you know, that was even more uncommon on the internet than today to have a paywall. And it really kept the riffraff out as well. So, I mean, you will just naturally have a different culture by virtue of there is a little bit of legwork to find an instance and get stood up. It's not that complicated, but it's enough that, you know, Joe six pack is probably not signing up for Mastodon, which, you know, can be appealing um, in some ways. So anytime you create some sort of barrier to entry to a social network, I think it makes it better. All my favorite ones have always been not a free for all. And <clears throat> I mean, believe it or not, and boy, I'm going to really age myself here because any Gen Z listening to this are just going to laugh, but Facebook actually, when it used to be gated to just people 
in university was actually kind of cool back in the day, like in mid 2000s, 2004, 2005 timeframe. Um, when it was pretty exclusive, it was actually a pretty neat tool. It's when the doors got thrown open and grandma started complaining about all the news stories on there that it kind of went to hell. But, um, this is again, that opportunity and it's not new, you know, acknowledging that it's been around, but it still is a different thing and not everybody's on it. That's, that's really cool. And it's a chance to explore and build a new community that is fundamentally different and probably better in some key ways. Because again, you just don't have that low value content or those people on just to, um, you know, not contribute positively to say the least. So, you know, there was, there was some article that I read about how the InfoSec Twitter is fractured from, you know, this Twitter uh, migration essentially. And a lot of people are asking whether or not this Mastodon thing will last if, if we'll be here. And I can just say, you know, social media is essentially that it's social. And so the people that are there make the difference. And I will tell you that the majority of the people that are fairly well known in Twitter are more and more active on Mastodon every single day and less active on Twitter. Um, Some people are still cross posting and posting things on both. Um, But a lot of them um, have even left completely where they've deleted all of their tweets from the last you know, few years um, and just basically clean their timelines and, and stop logging in. So I think if people are passionate for a project or, or, or a community that it will succeed. I'll just give a quick example. Um, I'm, a, I'm a gamer and one of the first MMORPGs, um, massively multiplayer um, RPG games that was online that I ever played was a game called city of heroes. And it was small. Not many people played it. It was one of the very first ones that charged an actual subscription. It came out in 2004 and I played it a lot and we had a great community there. Um, The game was well loved. And then of course, another game called world of Warcraft came out in November of that year, which overshadowed um, this game and and so a lot of folks left for that one but over the years it was well liked in 2012 all the servers shut down they just didn't have enough subscribers the, you know the studio decided we're just shutting this game for many years there was an underground rumor that there were some private servers and it turned out in 2018 or 2019 that someone um, leaked it, that there were active servers that were private. Someone had exported the code and they were running their own instances of this game. And there was like an uproar. Like, how could you keep this from us? Like, this is so beloved and nostalgic. And, um, and the devs, I mean, part of it was mainly because it was intellectual property and they were afraid that they were going to get sued by the company if they started to open it up. What was decided among the people who were the administrators of these private servers to open it up to the general public and one of the biggest servers. And so it's, it's kind of like Mastodon, but there's not a federation. There's a bunch of different instances where people run it. Um, I actually play on one of the largest ones called homecoming. And these folks um, take donations Every month they run it on their own hardware and they're not making any money. And if you're familiar with MMORPGs, there's people called game masters. So when you submit a ticket and you're stuck on a mission or you're stuck on a boss or something like that, or something glitches in the game, these game masters can respond and they can essentially have God mode and reset your stuff, right? Um, Make loot appear (laughs) in your bags that it disappeared or something like that. So, um, yeah, so it's all community run and it's been thriving. It's thriving so much that they're actually releasing new content in these private servers. There's developers who are actually working on the code on their own free time to better the game. There's new classes that are coming out, new 
you know, content, dungeons, whatever. Um, so it is thriving, and I feel like this is something that can do that too. Um, time will tell, but like I said, I, all I can say is the majority of the folks that I respect and get information from, they've all really moved to Mastodon. So, um, and we'll see what happens this weekend with Twitter, but like we talked about in the beginning, they are living on borrowed time is what I think. I think it's just a matter of time before stuff just starts to fail with, with that skeleton crew. Agreed. And so maybe a little bit of, and this is not normally my style to be pessimistic. Um, I, I think Mastodon will do well just because it seems like there's already critical mass in certain communities. And I think that's kind of a different thing. Like it's not overall critical mass because Twitter was never like that. Twitter was never the place you hung out with all your in real life friends. That was more of an Instagram and a Facebook thing. Twitter was always like your online friends, your online community around a subject or a, a topic. Um, <clears throat> so one of the communities I'm, I'm really active in or, or used to be more so less so today uh, was the Apple community, like around iPhone and stuff like that. I you know, found that really interesting and a lot of cool people there. And I remember in the early 2010s, there was a rival to Twitter that came out called app.net. Andy, I remembered the name now from the pre-show. So app.net was this new thing on the scene and you could write longer messages at the time. Twitter messages were still limited to 160 characters or whatever they were 130. Um, and you know, uh, app dot that app dot net allowed 256. And it was so well supported that the most popular Twitter client in the Mac and Apple community was Tweetbot. Um, the developer of that called Tapbots and Paul Hadid actually took that code and adapted it for app.net and released like an app.net bot. Um, that was essentially Tweetbot just tweaked to run on that service. And I still use Tweetbot to this day. I think it's the best Twitter client, by the way. Um, but e even with all that backing from the Apple community, the best client was ported to that platform. Everyone was going to move to it. It, it. it just didn't catch on enough mass in that community to catch on. Um, and everyone was still in Twitter. But at the same time, here's the thing. And here's the difference. Never doubt the power of a compelling event to change behavior, to be an inflection point for behavior. And that's the difference. With app.net, there was nothing really making people like leave Twitter in droves other than general dissatisfaction of like they weren't addressing needs, the service wasn't advancing enough, whatever. But those seem minuscule compared to the challenges facing the service today. And so that is both kind of the pessimist and optimist view at the same time in that there have been really compelling alternatives in the past with really good support that still didn't catch on um, that were arguably even easier to get into. Um, but at the same time, you didn't have that compelling event driving people to it. So I don't think Mastodon is ever going to be like, you're going to see the logo and a hashtag in the corner of the screen when you're watching like, you know, some programming on NBC or something like that on a Tuesday night. But at the same time, I think especially in technical communities where people have some technical aptitude, it could become the social network of choice. And it sounds like for InfoSec, maybe it already has. And that alone is enough because, again, you don't need everyone there. You need your community there. And it sounds like for some communities, that's where they're at now. So it'll be continued story to follow both the downfall of Twitter and the growth of these alternative platforms. But now our listeners at least have an idea of what Mastodon is, how to get started and how to get going. So Andy kind of thank you for sharing your experiences. And uh, uh, one thing we didn't really get to on the show tonight, but uh, Andy did try to set up his own Mastodon instance. And there were some trials and tribulations along the way that were fun to follow over the course of this last week. So um, really cool stuff. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes as well as some of the links that we refer to throughout the show. 
Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.